Now that you know what a function generally is and you know the you know the whole mapping issue where we show the relationships between x and y through the mapping diagrams and you know the types of functions and what a domain and range is generally, we can move to the in-depth definitions of domains and ranges. So our second part of the tutorial is actually about the domain of a function. So what is a domain? First of all, in order to convert any mapping into a function, we need to restrict the number of possible inputs. Why is that? Because simply sometimes not all numbers can be put. For instance, when, in, when I was giving you examples previously, we had a function that was equal to 1 over x. And we said that x cannot equal to 0 because simply 1 over 0 is non-existent. It's, it's, you can divide a number by 0. And this is why our domain ex ex excludes the zero. So rather than assuming that uh, the domain is all real numbers, we can confine it. And also another reason we do that is because, for instance, when we had the function 3x squared, we knew that it was actually a many to one function because many to one function. And then when we drew it, we had something that looked like this. Now, if we wanted to convert our, our parabola here into actually a one-to-one -one function, we can say, we can restrict the domain to have it to be x is greater than or equal to zero. In that case, our graph will only be the second half part like this, and that way it's going to be one-to-one. -one. And sometimes we do need that. Why we would need that? You'll notice in the inverse function part of this tutorial, which is the last part of this tutorial before the tips and tricks. But it is essential to have a function one-to-one -one in order to have an inverse. This is what you need to know for now. So what, we, what we're doing is that we're confining it so each input gives exactly one in output. So it's a one-to-one -one function. And uh, so by restricting the input to real numbers greater than or zero, we, lo we no longer have a problem of various inputs for the same output. So this is a one-to-one -one function. So... Uh, so how do you, but this is the case where we intentionally convert it from many to one to one to one. But how about cases like this? Here it was really obvious that yes, we do not need our x to be zero or else it won't work. Now, here are the two rules to knowing your domain. So in order to know the domain, you have to look at both the numerator and the denom denominator. Now, uh, what is as you know, the very important part about the denominator, which is the easy part, is that we cannot have the denominator equal to zero. So that is the general rule for combining your domain, uh, that it cannot, it cannot equal to zero. So if we have 1 over x, we know that x is not equal to zero. Now if we have 1 over x plus 3, we know that x plus 3 cannot equal to zero, and in other words, x cannot equal to negative 3 etc 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 you take the whole number at the bottom and you equate it to zero and then you make sure that the answer of x is not in your domain and it can actually be more than one so in the case if we had one over x squared plus four um yeah one over x squared minus four so that's right here x squared minus four you know that x squared minus four cannot equal to zero and x squared cannot equal to four in other words x can neither be plus two or negative two so you can have more than one value restricted from your domain this is how you find it when you're looking at the denominator now the numerator is simpler it's only the case where there is a radical as you know the equation of a radical as we said will give you a graph that looks like this uh, for a function. Now, as you see, it always starts from zero and never before, unless, of course, there is an, a shift on the x-axis. However, what we mean is inside the radical itself, naturally, the number cannot be negative. So simply the number inside here should be greater than or equal to zero. But Rad radical of negative three does not exist. So you cannot do this. Now, if you have a value like x plus 3 inside, you know that x plus 3 should be greater than or equal to 0, and that means that your x is actually greater than or equal to negative 3. If it's smaller than that number, then your function does not exist. And this is how you restrict your domain in order to ensure that all the values that can be there are there, and the values that cannot be there are not there. And this is the whole science 
behind the domain. You if you want to figure the domain, you check your numerator and your denominator. If you want to restrict your domain in order to have a one-to-one -one function, you simply make sure that you have the part of the graph where there is zero symmetry, where it does not reflect on the other axis. Or in other words, in, in where when you do the horizontal line test, which is just drawing a line anywhere, you do not have two values crossing it or even more. You just want one value for every horizontal line you can draw. And that's all about domain. Now, moving on to range. Now, as we said at the beginning of the tutorial, that when we're thinking of domain, we're thinking about the x. And when we're thinking of, about the range, we're actually thinking about the y. So the range tells us the possible outputs. When x, x was the input, y was the output. So the range tells us the possible outputs that we can get from our function. So in the example of f of x equals to x squared, we know that our graph is something like this. And we know that it's as long as x increases, your y is increasing. In other words, it can go infinitely upwards. And we know that our range is then, this e is element of, which means it can be all real numbers. r with two lines is all real numbers. Now, does your range, does your range ever get restricted? Yes, it does. For instance, when we have the example we gave before of f of x equal to 1 over x. We said that our graph is something like this. We know that our x is going to be any value that is not so equal to zero. So it's a real numbers minus the zero. So and when we do that, we know that it's also ha it doesn't only have a, the um, it has both the x and y asymptotes as uh, axes as asymptotes. So it means that our y can neither also it cannot also be zero because simply there is no matter what you put for x at the top you'll never have a zero. So your range is never going to be zero. So this is what the range is about. It's just calculating the possible values on the y axis. You can know your maximum values, you can know your negative values using differentiation, and that these are things you get into depth for later on or in other parts or in other chapters. But this is the idea behind the range. It is simple and easy, but it needs you. Uh, it just needs you to think of the numerator, denominator, your possible values, and you're good to go. And that would be basically be everything that relates to simple functions, which means we can move on now to our composite functions.